Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you here tonight. Welcome to the convocation service of the Protestant Reformed Theological Seminary. The convocation marks the beginning of a school year for our seminary. Classes began already last week, so uh, the life of the seminary is in full swing. And yet we're thankful that we can come together tonight to uh, encourage the professors and the students in the work that they are called to do. And your presence here tonight is a great encouragement to them as well. So thanks everyone for coming tonight and being here to show your support. And then together we can pray uh, for the seminary of our churches as well. Uh, just a reminder that after the convocation service tonight, there is a time of refreshments. There'll be some refreshments in the back and uh, some downstairs as well, and everybody's invited to attend and stay for that. Let's now turn in our Psalters to number 134. 134. Uh, versification of Psalm 48, a psalm about the church. Let's sing together, let's rise to sing all three stanzas of 134. Now we're going to have a time of prayer, and as we pray tonight, we're especially going to focus on the work that is being done and will be done in this coming school year in our seminary. So let's come before God now in prayer. Father, on our earthly pilgrimage to our heavenly home, one of the greatest joys that we are given week by week is to gather in thy presence and with thy people to worship. And when we worship, the focus of that worship is especially the hearing of the preaching of the gospel. We are thankful for that great gift. 
Because we live in a world of darkness and chaos and struggle and hardship in our lives and in this world around us. We are constantly attacked by the evil one. And he tempts us with his lies. And we easily fall prey to them. But in the midst of this darkness, thou dost give to us the glorious light of thy word. That word which is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And thou hast given to us as well the preaching of the gospel that expounds that word to us so that our hearts are comforted, so that we are turned from sinful ways, so that we see and understand truth, and so that we're strengthened to live in godliness. But we are also thankful then that thou dost supply men to preach that glorious gospel We remember what the Holy Scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. And how beautiful are those feet that preach that gospel because faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of the living God through his servants who faithfully proclaim that word. Tonight we are thankful for our seminary where men are trained for the gospel ministry so that we and our children and our children's children may have that glorious gospel of grace proclaimed to us. We need it. We desperately need it week by week. And so we are thankful that in our seminary, men who have been called by thee and ordained into the gospel ministry may also teach others to be preachers of the word so that we may continue to have the preaching of the gospel in our churches. We ask then, as our seminary begins a new school year, that thou wilt bless the work that is done there, uphold and strengthen the faculty in all the work that they are given to do. We thank thee, O God, for each one of the professors and the gifts and abilities that thou hast given to them, We have some men who have been teaching there for many years. Professor Kamiga and Professor Gritters continue to bless them in their work and grant them the stamina that is needed to carry on in that work as soon that work does come to a conclusion for them. We're thankful for their many years of service and the professors who have gone before teaching the truth of thy word so that men are faithfully equipped to be preachers of the gospel. But we also pray for the men who continue in the work there more recently, be with Professor Kuyper as he continues to teach. We pray that that will be with Professor Heising and Professor Grease as they begin their labors and are teaching new classes. Give them all that they need as well, so that they may faithfully instruct another generation of preachers of the word. We're also thankful for students that thou hast given to us, men who have felt the call to the ministry of the word. We pray that thou will bless them in this new school year, so that as the gospel is proclaimed in the classrooms, they would grow in their knowledge of thee and the knowledge of the truth. We pray that thou would strengthen them evermore in their relationship with thee and thy son, Jesus Christ, and strengthen them also that they would walk in all godliness and holiness in response to that word that they learn and that is taught to them. In a special way, we pray for Aaron Hovman, who's not with us tonight, but who is on his internship in Pittsburgh. Will thou bless that time that he has there so that he may be equipped for the gospel ministry through the instruction of Reverend Brinesma and the fellowship that he enjoys in the Pittsburgh congregation. We're also thankful for the support staff that that was given in our seminary, uphold and strengthen them, that Mr. Chuck Terpser and Valerie Klein may be a, a blessing to the faculty and the students as they carry on in their work. But Father in heaven, the great desire that we have is that we would have more men for the preaching of the gospel. Thou hast taken ministers away from us and thou hast humbled us by doing that, 
But at the same time, there are many churches that need pastors right now. Some have been without pastors for quite some time. And we pray that that will provide pastors for them, but also more generally provide pastors in our churches. And so it's our fervent prayer, as we have offered to thee many times before, it's our fervent prayer, send men. That men who love the truth and love Jesus Christ and love his church would come forward and desire to serve Jesus Christ and his church by preparing for the gospel ministry. But, oh God, we're reminded in this of our complete dependence upon thee. But use mothers and home and fathers and their good instruction and the Christian schools that we've been given as well to prepare men for the gospel ministry also. We ask, Father, for thy blessing then upon our churches. We pray that, they, we, that we may live together in peace and love, that we love the preaching of the gospel, that we would hear that preaching as it comes through the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, ambassadors who are called and equipped by him. And may we love that preaching. And we pray then, Father, that there would not be in our churches a famine of the word. Bless our time together tonight. We pray a special blessing upon Professor Heisinger as he expounds to us thy word for the encouragement especially of the faculty and the students as they begin a new school year. But also may this be edifying for us all and glorifying to thy great and holy name. We pray all of these things in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, who is the head and the king of his church. Amen. We're not going to turn in Holy Scripture to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy two. I'll read the entire chapter. This is the word of God. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully." The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, 
and some to honor, and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. And thus far, we read God's holy and inspired word. At this time, we have the a great privilege and treat tonight of hearing the, some of the students in the Protestant Reformed Student Orchestra. We're thankful for their willingness to share their gifts and abilities uh, with us tonight. They'll be playing uh, two numbers for us, so the orchestra may come forward.
Mr. Phelps and students, thank you so much for that. It was beautiful, as it always is, and so we're thankful for your being here tonight. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker tonight is Professor Brian Heisinger. He's the professor of dogmatics and Old Testament in our seminary. I believe this is his first convocation address that he gives tonight. And the theme of his address is the Protestant Reformed Minister today, Professor Heisinger. Members of the Theological School Committee, colleagues, students, staff, friends and family of the Protestant Reform Seminary, it is my great privilege to address you this evening on the occasion of our annual convocation exercise. This one marking the beginning of the 2023-2024 school year. I've chosen as my topic tonight, the Protestant Reform Minister today. And I've done that for three reasons. The first concerns target. The target at which we aim. The Protestant Reform Seminary exists to train men to become ministers in the Protestant Reformed churches. To be sure, it's been our great privilege over the years to participate in one degree or another in the training of men who do not intend to be ministers in the Protestant Reformed churches, but in other churches, and we're very happy to do that. Nevertheless, the seminary exists not to train men for other denominations or for men to become ministers in general, but to become ministers in the Protestant Reformed churches. No one has ever expected otherwise, inside or outside the seminary. This is a denominational seminary of the Protestant Reformed churches. This is stated already in the very first sentence of the very first article of the Constitution of the Theological School. I quote, the Theological School of the Protestant Reformed Churches has for its purpose the training of future ministers of the Word for the aforesaid churches. So tonight we cast ourselves upon our great God in His mercy and we plead with Him to use the seminary to make for us ministers for the Protestant Reformed Churches. And that Protestant Reformed minister is the target at which we aim. So. Just like the woman who leads a cake baking and decorating class on day one, before the students ever touch any of their instruments or their ingredients, ingredients, she holds up before everyone a model, a finished cake, at the very least a picture of one. This is the target at which we're all aiming in this class. So tonight we want to hold up the target. And then from the perspective of the seminary, we who train and we who are trained aim at the target. So the title of my speech is The Protestant Reform Minister Today. The second reason for this speech concerns the history, the continuation of the history we are in the remarkable providence of God and the uh, astonishing covenant faithfulness of God one or two strides uh, away from the centennial of the seminary. That line that marks 100 years, that's June 2025. Now, the beginning of the 2023-2024 school year. So we are just a stride or two away from the 100-year line. Way back at the beginning, we had professors with names like Huxma and Uphoff, and we had students with names like Cornelius Hanko and Garrett Voss, 
And way back in the beginning, we had men who had very strong convictions and passion for the particularity of God's grace. That God's grace is only ever for His elect, those who are in Christ Jesus. And strong convictions for the sovereignty of God's grace that those whom God saves, God effectually saves. And so, way back in the beginning, now we're still in the thick of the 1924 controversy with the doctrine of common grace and the now hugely popular, well-meant offer of the Gospel. Those men did not believe a doctrine like that was out on the periphery and at which one could wink, but it was inherently Arminian and it took aim at the very heart of Reformed Orthodoxy. But that was way back then, almost a hundred years ago. What about today? Do the men in the seminary still have the same biblical and confessional convictions? Does the history, does the doctrine continue and even develop? So tonight, the Protestant Reformed minister today the target, the history, and then third, the times. Right now, the extraordinary times in which we live. These are challenging times from the biggest perspective. These are not the most challenging times. That would be an exaggeration. The church has lived through more challenging times. Read church history. And the church is living through more challenging times in different parts of the world. You can read reports coming out of Myanmar as the council here distributes those. And the church will live through much more challenging times. Read Matthew 24 and, for example, Revelation 13. Nevertheless, these are very challenging times. These are very, very challenging times for many of the well-known Reformed and Presbyterian denominations throughout the country and the world. Just read their magazines. The devil's relentless. And for us in the Protestant Reformed churches and for our ministers of late, we've had major issues, a doctrinal controversy, COVID pandemic, schism, the exposure of cases of sexual abuse. These are major issues. And then you take any one of them and all the different opinions and even wrong responses from many different areas on any one of these issues, challenging times for the ministers especially. And then Satan attempts to exploit these issues and to create the factions of Corinth so that though all the ministers are orthodox and all the ministers are members in good standing, there may be sometimes the temptation to start dividing them up based on how they relate to some of these major issues. And I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, me and my family were of reverend so-and-so, or we think there's maybe three, four, five, maybe six good ministers in the churches. The rest, I don't even know if we'll listen to them when they preach in our church. Dividing them up. And then the temptation for the minister can be pride, to the, the urge to, to be a hero and fit into one of those classes or to be afraid and not dare repudiate that kind of attitude if it ever should manifest itself. Challenging times. And then on top of that, what hurt has been done to the denomination by Protestant Reformed ministers who have left and publicly condemned the churches and cast a barrage of wild, outrageous, unfounded, slanderous accusations against the churches drawing or hoping to draw some with them. Today. Extraordinary times today. And so, the title of the speech is The Protestant Reform Minister Today. I'd like to call your attention to three things. The Protestant Reform Minister today, first, generally, second, specifically, and then third, principally, that is, 
chiefly. I'd like to say two things about the Protestant Reformed minister generally, first addressing his task, and then second, his character. We want to prepare men in the seminary for their task in the ministry, and although the times are extraordinary, the task never changes. The task for the minister and for all Reformed minister is spelled out with its four elements in the form for the ordination of ministers. I briefly summarize. Task one, explain the Word of God faithfully to the flock. The form continues by stating that the minister applies that word for the edification of the hearers, instructing, admonishing, comforting, and reproving according to everyone's need. He preaches repentance toward God and reconciliation with Him through faith in Christ. And he refutes all schisms and heresies. In short, the minister's task is to open up the word from the consistory room to the catechism room to the counseling room to the hospital room and especially in the pulpit on the Lord's Day. Open up the word. Explain that word faithfully in the service of the gospel of Christ to the flock. The Apostle Paul puts it this way by inspiration in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, the entire seminary curriculum is designed to fit a man for this task. Two, he prays publicly on behalf of the congregation. Of course, he prays privately but he prays publicly in the worship service on behalf of the whole congregation. Church, article or church order, Article 16, makes prayer his first task. And the minister ought to think about this. Am I giving to prayer what it deserves? And the consistory can think about that. And we in the seminary need to think about that. Are we training men to be fit to pray and to prepare to pray. Professor Kaminga did a fine job laying this task before us in our opening chapel exercise last week. To use the language of the end of verse 22, the minister ought to be the first of those that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. He prays. Task number three, according to the form, is that he administers the sacraments as instituted by the Lord. Isn't it a great privilege to be able to partake of the sacraments? Can you imagine not being a member of a church and you never have the sacraments? I would argue it's an even greater privilege to administer them when the minister is leading the divine worship service and the minister is in the Spirit and the minister is administering those sacraments through which God communicates in a very powerful way His love, that, that's one of the, the greatest moments on the face of the earth, experiencing the nearness of God and the power of His love. And there too, the minister, to use the words of verse 6, ought to be the first partaker of the fruits. And then fourth, his task, according to the form, is to keep the church of God in good discipline and order. So through faithful preaching, by participating in family visitation, by being a member of the consistory, laboring to ensure there's good order in this church, there's good order here, and then the right application of Christian discipline to the impenitent, those who, according to the words of verse 26, are ensnared by the devil and taken captive by him at his will. Fourfold task. Really, it lines up with the substance of the three marks of a true church. The word, the sacraments, discipline, and then you take prayer, which ties them all together. So this fourfold task helps give definition tonight to the target at which we aim in the training of men to be
Protestant Reformed ministers. As we consider the Protestant Reformed minister today, let's also address now generally his character. In these extraordinary times of the TSC, the seminary faculty and the local consistory take and ought to take as seriously as ever the whole matter of a man's character. Gifts are very important. Gifts of intellect and knowledge and oratory, communication. Of course we want men who can understand the doctrine and can rightly articulate it with clarity and conviction and perhaps even captivate an audience. And we want men who can relate to the sheep and communicate well with them as a pastor. But God has given to some of the most profane and godless men of history astonishing mental, verbal, and interpersonal skills. But what about the man's character? Is he a man of God in heart and life? Does he reflect the Lord Jesus? And is he a, is he a living illustration of the power of godliness? Is he honest? Is he? Is he honest, sincere, humble? Is he actually the man he shows himself to be, or is he a fraud? So that years down the road, even the elders say, we thought we knew him. Is he devoted? Not to himself in pride and selfish ambition, wanting a name above all other names in the churches, seeking to get it, at least to die trying? Is he devoted? Not to the world and all of its entanglements, verse 4. Is he devoted to the captain? Jesus is a good, good soldier. And what he must strive when he must strive for the cause of right doctrine, and when he must strive for holy living in the church, does he strive in the right manner? Because how he works matters to the Lord. Verse 5, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. You can read through the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, and notice they don't emphasize gifts, abilities, skills. Character. Probably the main word is verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. Faithful men. And then you could look again at the verses 22 through 26 and all the words there. The Protestant Reformed minister we seek to train today, same minister Paul sought to train, same minister the Reformed churches have always sought to train according to the form for ordination, a man faithful in his task and upright in his character. That on the Protestant Reformed minister generally, but now we become more specific as we hold up the target and hone in specifically. The Protestant Reformed minister ought to love the churches in which he is a minister. How can he perform his task? And how can he be upright in character if he doesn't love the Lord Jesus and the churches in which the Lord Jesus has placed him. A Protestant Reformed congregation is a manifestation of the body of Jesus, a true church of our Lord. Christ dwells there in the midst by his word and spirit. And through the office bearers, Christ exercises the keys of his kingdom. And that congregation in her particular geographical locale is God's light in a world of darkness. 
She has a history in this world beginning with her organization and that's real church history directed by the Spirit. She's a bastion of God's truth in a godless, corrupt, and violent world that hates God. She's made up of the people of God. She is the people of God, the sons and the daughters of God who are precious to God and their children. She's birthed by, she has her life in the gospel of God. She gathers to worship God. She strives at the high mark of the glory of God. That Protestant Reformed congregation, she's imperfect. And even the little children will learn that very early on. My church is not perfect. And with all those imperfections, blemishes, and wrinkles, she's sanctified in the Lord Jesus Christ. The one church of our Lord manifested through the whole world is manifested in the PRCA from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Edmonton, Alberta. True churches of Christ. And now it ought to go without saying that the minister in those churches loves, loves the congregation in which he ministers and loves the churches of which he is a part. How could a man be a member of the PRCA be trained in the seminary of the PRCA, make a solemn vow before his God at his ordination into the ministry in the PRCA and discharge the duties of his office in the PRCA. If he doesn't love the congregation in which God placed him and the denomination to the question, do you love your congregation? And do you love the denomination? There ought to be a swift and hearty, of course I do. And that doesn't mean you hate anyone or anything that's not in the PRCA. What a wicked notion. But you love Jesus, and Jesus put you here, and He's given you so much and given us so much, do you love your congregation and the churches? It's very, it's very, very difficult today to find love and loyalty anywhere. You just talk to employers and all these young people coming up. They're hard pressed to find workers who will love the company, be loyal to the company. Look at all of the young people, especially in the secular institutions of learning today. It's hard to find even one who has one patriotic bone in his body has any allegiance to the red, white, and blue? The, the bashing and the hating of the very country in which one still has so much freedom from the workplace to the country? It's hard to find love, loyalty, commitment, but it ought not be that way in the church. When our Lord in the abundance of His grace brings us sovereignly into His body, and then he puts us in a manifestation of his church on earth. We ought to love that church. And when we stand up in a few moments and sing from 350, I hope we all sing from the heart. And for the house of God, the Lord, my loving care shall never cease. Love the church. I'll serve the church. The Apostle Paul who trained Timothy and Timothy, who trained others, loved the churches. The apostle speaks of that. He tells the churches in his epistles. He loved the churches, except Corinth. Right? He loved the churches except Corinth, because in Corinth were the schismatics who were dividing up according to their favorite minister. And in Corinth, they tolerated that man living with his father's wife, a fornicator, and in Corinth they were carnal and they ran to the courts of the civil state suing each other over petty matters. In Corinth they denied the bodily resurrection. Corinth is the church you condemn, you disassociate with, and you leave, and if I could put it this way, you kick it out of the denomination of churches, right? Corinth? No, 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 no. He may have loved them more than any other church. 
Paul wrote them not one, not two, but at least three letters. He says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9, I wrote unto you not to keep company with fornicators. First epistle. I wrote unto you. That's the first epistle. 1 Corinthians is his second letter. 2 Corinthians is his third letter, the first one being uninspired and not part of the canon of Scripture. He wrote them at least three letters. We do not stop loving the church when problems arise, when many, many Corinthian-like problems arise. That's when love begins to show its power and genuine character and when love goes to work serving love for the churches. That love of Paul, though, was only a dim reflection of the love of our Lord who laid down His life for the church, for that bride who of herself was rebellious and God-hating. Christ died for the church. And though He's bought us and He's reconciled us unto God, we're doomed. We are doomed. If the continuation of the love of Christ depends upon whether He sees any sin, any imperfections in us, His church, the power of His love is not that He is loving right now a perfect bride. The power of His love is that He's loving us right now an imperfect perfect bride with all of our blemishes, spots, and wrinkles, sanctifying us by His grace until the day He presents us without spot or wrinkle in the great glorification. Love for the church. And so the seminary aims to produce men who will love our churches. And our desire is that our most recent graduate very soon will move to Edmonton and be ordained in Hosanna. And that brother Matthew Kerner will love those saints who fear God's name and walk as in his sight and find them to be the excellent of the earth, they and their children, and in them his delight. That's what we want. Men who love God's Saints. What does that love look like? Well, of course, that first task explain the word faithfully to the flock. But I'd like to call your attention to three particular manifestations of that love I believe important. Number one, if a man loves the churches, he will view and treat and speak of the churches as the body of Christ. You will not view and treat and speak of the churches as a collection of unbelievers and heretics. You will not slander the doctrine, the life, and the people of the churches. You will not maintain a hypercritical spirit that studies to find faults in people and in the churches. And he will not take a bad personal experience. You may all have one. He will not take a bad personal experience and then conclude that anybody who was involved in that is a bad person, an enemy of God, and then broad stroke the whole denomination and condemn all the churches as corrupt because of his bad personal experience. Not only will he avoid wicked slander, accusations, and misrepresentations, but he will defend the churches in the midst of such attacks. And that's not pride. That's not denominational, institutional pride. Of course it's pride to defend the name of the churches and to cry, peace, peace, when the churches willfully oppose God and stand for what God hates. But it's not pride to 
to defend the churches. In the midst of attacks against the churches, on the one hand, we ought to humble ourselves uh, in the dust and examine ourselves and repent under the heavy chastening hand of God. And on the other hand, there is a time to stand up and courageously defend the churches for the honor of our head and for the love of what is pure and true. If a man loves the church, he will view, he will treat, he will speak of the church as the body of Christ, the lovely body of our Lord. Second, if a man loves the churches, he will oppose any evil that threatens the churches. No matter where you go on the face of earth, if you find a church of Jesus Christ and you stay there long enough, you are going to find sin and evil is inescapable until glorification. And the Apostle Paul says, endure. Verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness. Opposing evil is hard, especially when our natural response is to flee. Don't flee. Endure. So if anyone, including a minister, has a problem with someone, has a problem with a minister, has a problem with a consistory, has a problem with a school or a school board, believing violence has been done to the way of truth, violence has been done to the way of righteousness and holiness, then, then the calling is not, not to go on a furious rampage, bashing people in churches, but go to the source and humbly, carefully, courageously, lovingly, graciously, prayerfully go to the source of what you believe the problem to be. And if there are doctrinal and practical matters that need to be addressed publicly from the pulpit or in writing, then the minister must, in harmony with the good counsel of his elders, he must address the matters as the form for ordination teaches, he must refute with the Holy Scriptures all schisms and heresies. That is love for the churches. And then third, if a man loves the churches, he will love, defend, and promote the truth historically maintained by the churches. To be Protestant Reformed is not to be proud it's not to be radical. It's not to major in minors. It's not to maintain man-made, contrived distinctives. It is to be truly and consistently reformed according to the Reformed Confessions. Especially in confessing the particularity and sovereignty of God's grace in His covenant. In short, as our fathers would say, let God be God. We don't tell God how it is, and we don't tell people how it is. God tells us how it is in His Word. So we don't tell people that God gives grace to the reprobate, and that in the preaching of the Gospel, God has a sincere desire to save everyone who hears, including the reprobate. We let God be God, and God tells us in His Word that His grace is for those who are in Christ Jesus and for them only. And we love that truth. We do not tell people that God's covenant depends upon our activity of faith, upon our good works, upon our repentance, upon our prayers. We let God be God. And God tells us in His Word that His covenant is an everlasting covenant. And it depends upon the word of His promise, which never fails. And we love that truth. And we do not tell people that if God forgives the penitent, and if God gives blessings to His children who ask for them in prayer, then that's a conditional covenant. That's man-first theology. We let God be God, and God tells us in His Word that He forgives the penitent and that 
He gives to those who ask. And we love that truth. And we do not tell a married woman who is sinned against grievously by her adulterous spouse that she may not only divorce, but she may also find another man and remarry because God wants her to be happy. We let God be God. And God says in His Word that marriage is for life. And if one does remarry while the spouse yet lives, Romans 7, we must call her an adulteress. We love that truth, the lifelong bond of marriage. It's a good truth, and it's good for the children. If we love the churches, then we love, defend, and promote the heritage of the truth that God has given to the churches. In the seminary, we aim at the target of a Protestant Reformed minister, one who will love Christ, the head of the church, and love the churches, love the churches. Generally, specifically, and now, finally, the Protestant Reformed minister today, principally, chiefly, he is a man of grace. He needs grace, and by grace, he relies upon grace. And that's verse 1 of the chapter we read. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This is the most important thing about the man. He's a very, very needy man. You might be able to say he's the neediest man in the denomination. Who? The minister. He's so needy. And he may rely upon his own strength, but the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that reliance is captured in the prayer of Martin Luther that you find on the back of the program. The minister needs grace. Look at his task again. It's spelled out in the form, and it's straightforward with its four elements. But in reality, it's daunting and demanding. The minister could spend all week, all week, making two sermons in which he explains the Word of God faithfully to the flock so that they know Christ and Him crucified, but he doesn't have all week just for the two sermons. The minister often leads as many as six catechism classes. He leads a couple Bible studies. He cares for the sick, the needy, the widows and widowers. He does pre-marriage classes. He does marriage counseling and other forms of counseling. He's involved in consistory work, including the most challenging cases. He gives chapel speeches, graduation speeches, and special lectures. He particip participates in evangelism efforts. He sometimes serves on denominational committees or as a stated clerk or as a church visitor. He writes for magazines. He usually has a wife and children. And now you take that task and you set it in the context. Doctrinal controversy. Set it in the context. A COVID pandemic. Schism. And friends and families and marriages being torn apart. Exposure of cases of sexual abuse. And there's one word in Scripture to describe it all. Hardness. Verse 3. Hardness. And then look at all those elders in the consistory room. They're as busy and needy as the minister is. Hardness. And the apostle says, endure as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What makes a good soldier of Jesus Christ? Verse 1, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. God has boundless grace. He does. He has boundless grace in His Son crucified and risen from the dead. Forgiving grace, sanctifying grace, empowering grace, reassuring grace 
for the Protestant reform minister today and for the seminary students who desire to become Protestant reform ministers today. And God gives that grace so that the Protestant reform minister can endure hardness, can be faithful to his task, grace, so he can be upright in character, all the while loving the churches and the congregation in which he labors. Grace. In fact, God's grace is so powerful and God gives that grace in such rich abundance that just like the Lord who delighted in the will of the Father even when it meant agonizing toil on the cross, God gives grace in that hardness so that the minister delights. He does. Delights in his office and in his work. After outlining the minister's duties, the form for ordination states, from these things may be learned what a glorious work the ministerial office is, since so great things are affected by it. And the minister experiences that and gives to that a hearty amen. It is a glorious work. It's a privilege it's a blessing. It's an honor. It is such a joy. Today, too, it is. It is such a joy to be a minister in these churches. We pray for our Protestant Reformed ministers today. We do in the seminary. We think of them often. And then these students, we hope very soon, will join the ranks of the ministers and we'll keep praying for them. People of God who've come tonight, thank you for coming. Please keep praying. We are thankful for the love, the support, the care that you still have for the Protestant Reform Minister. Please keep praying. He's a needy man who needs the grace that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep praying that God gives that grace to the Protestant Reformed minister today. This has been a good night. A stirring prayer by Reverend Eriks. A very moving performance by the Protestant Reformed Student Orchestra. And a powerful address. We are a blessed people. And we must never forget that. Let's stand and sing Psalter number 350. Psalter number 350. Let's sing all of the stanzas. 350.
and good singing too. It's my privilege as rector to be able to introduce to you our student body. Our first student is absent tonight, as has been noted, and that's Aaron Havaman. Quite sure that Aaron is viewing us online. Good evening, Aaron, and to the Brinesmiths and to the congregation in Pittsburgh as well. A reminder to Aaron, there is a second semester after the internship, and we do expect you to be back in Grand Rapids. We have a third year student. I'm going to ask these students to arise along with their family members who may be here with them and face the audience. First of all, Aaron Van Dyke and his wife, Sarah, and their daughter, Olive. It's showing a little bit, but Sarah is expecting in March, and we rejoice with Aaron and with Sarah. Our second year student is Bruce Feenstra. Most of you at Hope know Bruce, although Bruce hails from Southern California. And then our new first year student, Isaac Van Baren, and his wife, Libby. Isaac and Libby have moved here from the Redlands area, but Libby is a daughter of this congregation. Kelsbeek is her maiden name, and Isaac is a son of our Crete congregation. They're holding each one of them a son, the oldest of whom is Benjamin, and the younger of whom is Titus. And then, our first entry into the special program that was approved by the Synod this past year. He is Mr. Joe Uphoff, who hails from the Grand Rapids area, and many of you will remember him likely. Although the last number of years, Joe and his family have lived in Loveland, Colorado. His family is in absentia tonight. His wife, Audra, is ill. And apparently she did not trust his supervision of their five children. <laughs> Who are, from oldest to youngest, Isaac, Judah, Alexandra, Ramona, and Cecilia. Thank you. And again, thanks so much for your support and a reminder that there are refreshments both in the back and in the basement after closing prayer by Professor Heisinger. Let us pray. Great God of glory, grace, and power, who loves us in the Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before Thee and plead with Thee tonight to give to us, to our ministers, to our seminary, our professors, our students, so much grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not want to be left alone. We will wrongly divide Thy word of truth. We will wrongly administer the sacraments. We will mishandle church discipline. We will hurt thy people. We will. Father in heaven, fulfill that great promise of our Lord who left this earth, saying, I will be with thee always, even to the end of the world. So give us grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, as thou hast done. O faithful God, we are sorry for our unfaithfulness. Make us holy. Make us thankful and give us the joy of our salvation. 
We thank thee for this evening. Bless us now. Keep us safe on our homeward way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.